Good afternoon and welcome to a special edition of Follow Tiki brought to you by News24. We are wrapping up day four of the ANC's National Policy Conference. We're coming to you live from the Nazarek Center. As we promised every single day, we'll try and speak to some of the power brokers within the ANC, the leadership of the party, as it tries to find new ideas or how to implement the ones that they have in trying to solve some of South Africa's challenges. Today, it was uh, the, 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 the delegates had actually started debating some of the big issues that have been quite contentious coming to this conference. We know that the issue of the economy, whether we should expropriate land without compensation, those are some of the debates that are going on behind uh, closed doors. But we've got the leaders here to break it down and get a sense of where the conversation is going inside uh, those <coughs> deliberation rooms. And right now, welcoming, uh, we are welcoming the chairperson of the Northern Cape, newly elected uh, yeah. chairperson of uh, the ANC in the Northern Cape, uh, Mr. Samani So Welcome to Polo well, thank you very much for having me here. You've been sitting in that uh, contentious room, I must say, where yeah. you are discussing the economy. Are you finding consensus on issues like white monopoly capital? Should it be racially defined? What are the delegates saying? Jack, it's a, it's a festival of ideas, uh, robust engagements which are taking place. There's areas of convergence and there's areas of disagreement. Uh, the issue that you specifically asked about white monopoly capital, there are some who firmly believe that the primary enemy of the National Democratic Revolution is white monopoly capital. And there's also another strong argument, which is actually one of the arguments from my province, mm. that the issue of white monopoly capital and monopoly capital is a misnomer. Uh, monopoly capital is the content and white monopoly capital is but just a form. So monopoly capital can present itself in different forms, both in terms of, of, of race and as well as in terms of geography. So our argument is that we should actually focus on the content. That is how we've been trained in the African National Congress, mm -hmm. to be able to differentiate between content and form. So our argument as the Northern Cape is that let's focus on the content, which is monopoly capital, which the strategy and tactics of 2012 is highlighting as the enemy of the National Democratic Revolution and, and our program for change. Obviously, you are withholding on this one that it yes. shouldn't be racially defined because, you know, in years to come, we might have uh, yes. black monopoly capital. But those that are op on opposite ends are arguing that in this current context yes. of South Africa, the economy is controlled by white people. Can you not just accept that and move the debate along? Why is it so serious? <coughs> A debate for you to win? In the strategy and tactics of the ANC, it's, racia, it's racially classified. The strategy and tactics is actually saying the enemy of the National Democratic Revolution program, it's monopoly capital. And how this monopoly capital presents itself, it's white concentration. So we say as the ANC in the Northern Cape, that definition and characterization of monopoly capital is adequate because our primary focus should be the content, which is monopoly capital, in whatever form it presents itself. It can be black, it can be yellow, it can be green. But monopoly capital is actually stifling growth, and monopoly capital actually inhibits our program for economic transformation. Why should South, African care, <coughs> South Africans care that the ANC is having this debate? Because I think for a black entrepreneur sitting yes. somewhere, what they're interested in is how are you going to break down the barriers that make it difficult for them to enter mainstream economy and actually compete? So, no, Jack, this is, a, this is a very important debate that should actually take place because uh, if you've got an economy that is highly concentrated, you'll sit with problems of low levels of growth, and then uh, you sit with problems where we, that our redistribution program will actually, be, will actually be stifled. So dealing with monopoly capital actually leads to concentration of wealth in the hands of a very few. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of our critical programs that will have to embark on. And that is basically part and parcel of what we call as the second phase of the revolution. Uh, of focusing at ensuring that there is economic transformation that benefits the previously disadvantaged in the country. 
does it suggest perhaps that the focus will move away from, example, triple BE and giving shares to black people in already big conglomerates? That are we, I'm trying to get a sense of once this is defined, what are there going to be any changes in terms of how you bring in black people into the uh, mainstream economy? Check some of the proposals which are coming up. It's radicalization of the BEE. And uh, there will be multiple approaches on how to ensure that we bring the previously disadvantaged in the mainstream of the economy. And tackling monopoly capital is one of those measures, but also introducing triple BE and radicalizing it might also, it's also one of the approaches that I think gen generally we agree on. I mean, how would be the different form of triple BE? What else would need to be done? For an example, the stake of blacks in, in, in businesses in South Africa, and uh, not only in terms of shareholding, but them getting actively involved in the management of those businesses. That is one of the issues that we are currently looking at. That we should not look at BE in a very superficial way about what is the shareholding of blacks within certain companies, but what is their role as well in the production I chain, think, okay. in the production chain in those companies. Mm. And the other contentious issue has been around land. Uh, the yeah. Northern Cape, uh, in <coughs> your proposals to this policy conference, you did not support the expropriation of land without compensation. Why is that? Jack, <coughs> the, the, the issue of expropriation without compensation is one of the contentious matters that we'll have to deal with. If you read Section 25 of the Constitution, many people actually misinterpret it. They say Section 25 of the Constitution is a right to property. Section 25 of the Constitution does not enshrine a right to property. It actu it's actually an expropriation clause, which actually tells how government should go about expropriating land. It should not be in an arbitrary way. It should be, it should be just and equitable. So Section 25 of the Constitution is already an instrument in the hands of the African National Congress. But because of lack of capacity, that's the reason why one of the arguments that we are pushing is that we need to develop it, we need to construct a developmental state, mm -hmm. a capable developmental state. A capable developmental state will actually exploit the expropriation clause, which is Section 25 of the Constitution and ensure that we embark on a much more accelerated program of land redistribution in the country. We don't agree with the issue of the referendum. There is no need for that There's because the Constitution say expropriate. That's what Section 25 of the Constitution says. But you can only expropriate under these conditions. And basically, are you in agreement that government has not exercised that right and that space that is given to it? Check, there's, 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 there's certain areas of weaknesses in implementation of policy. We agreed when we went to Mangawong that we must establish a pharmaceutical company. We said we must establish a mining company. And uh, there's we, said, uh, we said we must establish a state bank. Mm -hmm. All these, those things, when we, we discuss them, are issues in the pipeline still at a conceptual stage. But the reason for that, the reason for that is simply because of the limited capacity of the national government and, as well, and of the national government, including the SOEs, to go around these issues. That is the reason why, as the Northern Cape, our main argument is that we need radical implementation of policies. Radical implementation, implementation of, of policies. policies. That is exactly mm. what we are talking about. Mm. Because if you get into commissions, it's more of a regurgitation of the decisions that we took in the past which were not implemented. Somebody actually said it's like standing on a treadmill. It says 12 kilometers. Exactly. You're still looking you, at the same window. You are still, the same, you are, yes, you are still on moving. the same spot. Yes, mm. there's no movement. And that is what is costing you at the, at yes. the polls, I have to add. Check, uh, check our, our lack of capacity to effectively implement our policies creates a great deal of impatience, uh, particularly with our, with our traditional support base, which was at the receiving end of the apartheid system. Mm. So what we are coming up with here is the Northern Cape. We need radical implementation of ANC policies in order to ensure that we improve the quality of lives of the people of the country. Are you suggesting how to crack the whip when the ministers <coughs> you've deployed don't do their work? Check the, the kind of state that w what we are talking about, we say we need to develop it. We need to construct a developmental state, a capable developmental state. A capable developmental state should be a state with embedded autonomy should be a state that has got capacity to protect itself from the influence of private interest. 
if you hear all the issues which have been raised about the Guptas and all of that, the emails and all of that, if those things are true, that actually tells you that we are sitting with a state which does not have adequate capacity to protect itself against the interest of private individuals. And that's part and parcel of our work. Every time we sit in these forums, we think that the developmental state is a souvenir. You go to India, you go to Malaysia, when you come to the country, you find a developmental state. It's a product of construction and reconstruction, and we should start that work of constructing and building a developmental state that is responsive to the needs of the people of this country. Some have argued the Northern Cape is a really small province. Uh, what <coughs> is, you know, how do you influence when you come in with about, uh, probably over yeah. 100 delegates that you're coming here with, yeah. uh, competing with the likes of KZN that are standing at over 500? How do you get your voices through and to Check, check in the policy conference, it's all about the power of an argument. It's not about the argument of power. Maybe in December we'll be dealing with the issues of the argument of power. We've got 1,000 delegates, we've got 200 delegates. But here, it's about, it's about the power of the argument. Which argument makes more sense? Which argument is more persuasive and convincing? So that is not a much more important thing. But one thing that I need to tell you is that the population of the Northern Cape, it's about 2%, 2.1% of the population of the country. Mm. But in terms of the delegates inside the policy conference, Northern Cape constitutes six percent of the delegates. Mm. So, 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 there's a misnomer around the issue of the size of the province and the kind of influence we we can have. Mm. In actual fact, if you look at the split in terms of the balance of forces towards the national conference, you'll be shocked that everybody will be flying to the Northern Cape as a power breaker. Yeah, they will be looking for you. Can for those who will become the president here? Yes, it's possible because just right here we constitute six percent. Mm. of the delegates. And, and of you the, know, of, you've of thrown delegates. us towards uh, the elective conference in December. <coughs> yeah. um, there's this whole debate from a proposal that came through from KZN, where they're yeah. saying that, you know, you can have uh, the two pre top presidential contenders, yeah. the Deputy President, Sir Ramaphosa, and MEC member, Nkosa Zanatla Minizuma, but the loser of that must automatically become Deputy President. Where do you stand as a province on that? No, our responsibility as leadership is to manage the process of elections of leadership, and not to try to prescribe to the branches what should happen. Sorry, at the end of the day, you've got the branches of the ANC as the basic unit that will decide who will become the president. Out of excitement of discussions which are taking place, we get so much excited and we want to appropriate to ourselves the right to decide who should lead the ANC. So we can't, we can't, we can't come up with such a proposal, uh, putting up leadership by arrangement. ANC branches will, will nominate who they want, they will go to conference and they will elect whatever leadership they want to elect. But that process should be politically guided by the leadership without taking away the rights of ANC branches mm. because you'll be, you'll be eroding the very essence of democratic contestation of leadership within the ranks of the ANC. So I can't see how that formula might work out without trying to prescribe to the ANC branches what is it that they will have to do. But that's I think our first take as mm. the province, let me give you our first take of the province mm. is Number one is to ensure that we go to the national conference, it should be uncontested, and we use the national conference as a, to lay the foundation, a formidable foundation for 20, 2019 elections. That is our first take, that this conference that is coming, it should actually be a platform where we are going to launch our elections campaign for 2019. There should be no contestation of leadership. But if that does not work, there should be a fair contestation of leadership and try to mitigate the impact thereof. Because just after that conference, by the end of that conference, we'll be left with about 16 months to go to, to, to 2019 to elections. To an election yes. that we're expecting to be very tough for it the will ANC. Be, definitely, yeah. And I mean, um, I know you fight with us in the media, but we were at Colesburg when yeah. you were elected chairperson of the ANC. Yeah. And it was very clear, the Northern Cape is backing uh, Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa for that position. What happens if he loses? No, no. Let, let me just explain our position as the Northern Cape. We, we, we say there's one of the two approaches that you can take towards the national conference. The first approach is to be principled. The second approach is to be opportunistic. And then we agree to take the principled approach. Which is? And the principled approach is informed 
by what has been happening in this organization for the past 50 years. The traditions what of What has been happening in the ANC for the past 50 years, all ANC presidents, without exceptions, were first deputy presidents. That's what informs our position. And we are of the view that if the question arises on who should become the president of the ANC, the first person to be placed on the test of through the eye of the needle should be Comrade Cyril Ramaphosa. There should be extraordinary things that mitigate against his presidency that he should not become the president. So that is our view. It's a very principled position. Nobody can accuse us of opportunism of any form. It's a very principled position. We firmly believe, disregarding what other people are saying, that there is an established democratic practice within the ANC that the first person to consider when the position of the president becomes vacant is the deputy president. You've equally said that he does pass through the test of the... Uh, the, through the we still, we the still have to put him through that <laughs> test. We still have to put him through that test. It's a very difficult test. Mm. It's a very difficult test. I don't know whether we had an opportunity to read our document, 2001, Through mm. the Eye of the Needle, mm. which speaks about the quality of leaders that the ANC needs and the attributes which ANC leaders must have. It's a very difficult test. That's the reason why it's called through the eye of a needle. Mm. Because mm. not everybody will be able to go through there. So as the Northern Cape, we'll first put Sir for the position of the president on the test of through the eye of a needle. And yeah, we'll see how you it's think It's only he when succeeds. it does not pass that we'll consider somebody else. Unfortunately, we've <coughs> ran out of time. That was the newly elected chairperson of uh, the Northern Cape. But perhaps before I let you go, yeah. have you resolved your internal battles in the, in, in the Northern Cape? There was an issue of uh, a premier who went ahead and reshuffled and then came back. you came back and said she must res uh, reverse it. Is that issue resolved currently? Yeah, the, the reshuffling is reversed. It's reversed. It's reversed, yes. Thank you very much. And we're a better province now. You're a better province? Yeah. Have you found each other now? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, thank you very, very much. That was uh, the chairperson oh. of uh, the Northern Cape, the ANC in the Northern Cape, uh, Mr. Zamani Sol, joining us here on Politiki. A little bit earlier on, we had President Jacob Zuma do his walkabout, uh, 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 speaking and seeing what is happening at, around the stalls. And this is what we, he had to say. This policy conference going very well and I think anyone will agree when we say the results are going to be wonderful and the <clears throat> recommendations therefore to the national conference in December are going to take us very far forward. This policy conference is in a sense <clears throat> looking for solutions to challenges that face us, and, and we are crafting them as we discuss and taking decisions that were not there before. For an example, what is that we can do to ensure that all our resolutions and policies and programs are implemented? There is a very strong focus on that one because we realize that on the implementation side, there are some hitches and we are trying to solve those matters. So it is going absolutely very well. As a delegate myself, I am uh, highly elated. I really am in high spirits, good spirits. And let me say, even the delegates here are in good spirit. There's unity of purpose and uh, there aren't divisions, as uh, many people would have suspected. Uh, people are putting their ideas together and we are going to emerge with very good conclusions. sitting in commissions and earlier on of course we had uh, President uh, Jacob Zuma they also talking unity and of course as usual I'm sitting with our resident analyst Mpumele Lomkabela and also Ralph Matecha to get a sense of what is happening here and go behind the scenes and uh, analyze uh, the happenings here at the ANC's policy conference. Gentlemen thank you very much. And let's start there, the two leaders speaking unity. Uh, but of course, if you heard from Zamani Sol there, you know, the debate is still going on. That battle over, you know, should we expropriate land without uh, um, 
compensation or whether is it white monopoly capital that is the enemy or monopoly capital, that debate is still going on. Mpumi? Well, as leaders, you expect them to project uh, a sense of unity, a sense of purpose, a sense of direction. Um, Zuma is trying to do that. Cyril Ramaphosa is also trying to do that. So you wouldn't expect any one of them to speak about divisions, even if the divisions are there. Mm. So the divisions that they would refer to would be things like, you know, there's policy contestations. When we emerge from this uh, conference, we'll even have better policies, as Zuma says. Cyril talks about, you know, how wonderful this conference is. So as leaders, you would expect that. Um, but, you know, uh, from behind the scenes, from what we hear, from the details, uh, sometimes the debate go beyond normal policy contestations. They go, be, they, they, they go up to the point where people are fundamentalist into their approach. Mm, uh, people mm. come in here and say, this is our position and we can't change simply because we come from this region or we come from that. And we, our brief is that we stick to this point, which makes what Zamani Sol uh, is saying difficult to achieve. If you're going to try and influence people at the strength of an argument when their positions are fixed, Based and on where they come along from. along factional lines and as well. Regions, because yeah. we know that this is a proxy battle for the succession debate. Of course, we know, for example, that President Jacob Zuma has called for expropriation uh, of land without compensation. Uh, Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa speaks a very different language. And I can imagine that is where people are seeing uh, their, their stance and unable to shift on that one, Ralph. Well, uh, uh, you know, listening to President Jacob Zuma and Deputy President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, Clearly, they want to maintain the facade that says that the conference dealt with, uh, or at least is dealing with the substantive issues, which are policy positions. But I think what makes things quite difficult for members of ANC who are here is that uh, 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 policy positions are already matched to individuals. So if you, I would imagine, if you want to agree with someone, uh, or you want to agree with part of their argument, you are convinced with part of the argument, probably already thinking about what would that mean for the faction sure. that I stand for? Does it mean I'm yielding to that group? I'm abandoning uh, uh, my position? But I mean, when you, you're listening to uh, uh, people like Zamani, you, you do get sense that uh, there are those within the NC who want to deal with substantive matters. There are people who are saying that, fine, suppose we are matched to this position. This is our submission. Mm -hmm. Convince us, I mean, when they're, when, when they're also talking about uh, the candidate that they, 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 they are reported to support for that matter. They, they, there is substantive argument they are putting forward. At least one would expect that spirit to be reigning. But when you talk to people here on the floor, you don't get that. You, you get commitments to particular slogans instead of substantive ideas. We'll continue with that conversation. And of course, coming into this um, policy conference, you know, there were warnings around how this will not be about the succession debate. This is, will be purely around uh, policy proposals and looking at what are the challenges that are facing the ANC in government, what needs to happen and what needs to be implemented. But talking to the leaders, they have not been able to leave the succession battle. It has been part of the conversations that they're having. And earlier on, we spoke to the ANC's uh, Youth League's Provincial Secretary, Tandu Kolo Sabelo, who is differing with his province on the issue of if the two contenders uh, or the two presidential contenders should contest and the loser should then become the deputy president. Let's take a listen. Let's look ahead to December in terms of the succession battle. Your province has suggested that you should have uh, the two presidential candidates and the loser must get the position of deputy president. Is that something the Youth League backs? The ANC Youth League has a very clear po position in terms of leadership for, for, for December. One, the ANC Youth League believes that the ANC needs to be united at all costs. We need Apologies for that. We will try and resolve that.
technical issue. But gentlemen, what Sabelo was basically saying is that from where they stand, Nkosa Zana Jamine Zuma is strolling ahead. There's actually no competition. And for them, there should not be a leadership arrangement. So are you getting a sense that this unified uh, uh, leadership that they expect in December will actually happen? Mpumi? Well, the issue, I think, is whether um, the outcome would be ac accepted by the losing faction. Um, um, and there's a debate about whether you can rearrange these things prior. And I think there's a contest. I mean, people don't agree. I mean, the Sikhle Zigalala was here yesterday. His view was that um, uh, they think that whoever loses must now uh, take over the, the deputy. But at the same time, the other people are saying, but why do you want to fix uh, elections, elections yeah. where people should decide. So all the positions should be contested. So for me, I think it's a lack of trust in what happens afterwards. The different factions don't trust one another. And um, that's why they're seeking to, to actually, it's more like you're trying to create insurance of what might happen in case, uh, uh, you know, these other guys, if when they're angry, they've lost, you know, winner takes all. What if there's a cope? What if there's an EFF out of that? So you really want to, yeah. exactly. So, so the ANC is struggling to find a balance between democracy, you know, a democratic contest, legitimacy, and unity. They can't bring these three together. Mm. And I mean, um, could we have a Nkosa Zana Jamini Zuma and a Cyril Ramaphosa United Slate? I mean, just listening to even their approaches to policy or even their approaches to some of the challenges facing the ANC are very, very different. I mean, Nkosa Zana Jamini Zuma is very much supported by the likes of the ANC Women's League, MKMVA, the Youth League, who very much supported, for example, uh, President Jacob Zuma at all costs. And even this whole investigations around the Gupta family, they are not particularly interested in. Can we have the two of them find themselves and actually lead the party together? You know, ideally, the, the question of policy position of the two respective candidates shouldn't matter. Quite often when you listen to ANC members, they always say there is collective responsibility when it comes to the policies of the ANC. They are saying that uh, policies are not brought about by individuals, but they are collectively dealt with. Even the current uh, platform that they are having where they are dealing with policy is to crystallize a policy position as party members and come up with a common position. And that should ideally mean that uh, candidates should not necessarily be assessed directly on the basis of the policy. They should be assessed on the basis of their capability to implement ANC policies. And, and if you look at it from that point of view, you could say that uh, a compromise between that involves Cyril Ramaphosa and Lamini Zuma being on the same list can actually work. My view is actually that we can actually even go further down the line uh, when it comes to the other four members of the top six within the party, where you can start picking those members if you if you are willing to engage on that compromise, picking them in a way that you could have that 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 unifying list. Uh, unfortunately, there are those who are overconfident. I don't know rightfully so or wrongfully so. When you listen to the youth league, you listen to KZN, they seem to believe that they've actually got this thing they've back. Won it. And, they've and, the bag. and yeah. that is why they, they now want to say to Mr. Ramaphosa that, look, here is a condition for you. We're going to win, but uh, because we have got legitimacy problem. Uh, this this slate. We want you to stay so that we can legitimize us as the deputy. They are fearing that split that we are talking about. No one will it like would that. It be a term. repeat for Cyril Ramaphosa because that's how he got into uh, the 2012 elections mm -hmm. where uh, at the time President Jacob Zuma was under a lot of pressure. They were seen yeah. as a very factional mm -hmm. uh, list and that's how he came in to legitimize it. Would he do it again, Bumi? No, but you see, besides that, I mean, there's another issue here. I mean, the, the Zuma's faction and the KZN group, they tried the same thing in Mangaung, remember, where they wanted to fix the election. They said uh, uh, Khalima must agree to uh, become deputy to, 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 to Zuma. Only then would everything be fine with him in the next, in this conference in December. They were then going to allow him to. So mm -hmm. that's, that's about, they want to fix things all the time. Uh, and of course, when Halima refused their, 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 their proposal and wanted to contest Zuma directly, that was the end of him after he lost uh, from Zuma. And then Cyril came in again. Uh, they, they want to control the process. Uh, and now this is the second time they want to control how he comes in, how he gets out. So there is no guarantee that uh, if he were to agree to be deputy president, 
again now whether in the next round they'll vote for him to be the president. Because as soon as after the December conference, they would have again agreed on another process with their group on how they're going to fix the next outcome. So they are thinking long term. I mean, we did mention yesterday here that soon after the Mangaon conference, they had a, they had a, KZN had a 10-year plan. Within two weeks after that election in Mangaon, they decided that Nkosa Zana must be uh, the, the next president. Mm -hmm. So they had not even looked at how s whether Cyril is capable while, while he's in government to succeed Zuma. That was not a consideration because that was not what they were going to, to use to determine whether Zuma is capable of, or, or not. I want us to talk about somebody else, the yeah. TG, Treasurer General Zuelim Kize. Mm -hmm. He's on a very quiet campaign, but we do know that some have suggested that he could be the alternative mm -hmm. between the two should, as part of building this unity, are there any chances of anybody else crowding that space in that presidential race currently? We've, we've, we've basically said Cyril mm -hmm. Ramaphosa and Kosazan are the front runners, but could there be a possibility of somebody like uh, Zueli emerging from the wings? Look, I, I don't see him uh, becoming a compromise number one, but what I see him as it's, it's someone who's a perfect number two for both. He could serve as number two for Dlamini Zuma if Dlamini Zuma succeeds. Uh, I don't think there is, uh, and actually I think that camp I would don't want think him. Dima Buza will agree with that. Uh, it's a question of mm. legitimacy. The reality is that you, you can go as uh, the slate, the manner in which they've perfectly articulated the, the people mm. that they want on their slate. What is it that you are winning? Are you going to win a party that has got, uh, 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 are you going to win as a group that has got no legitimacy? So that is why the likes of Zelim Kiza are very important for even. Uh, Dlamini Zuma for the purpose of, leg of legitimacy. And he could also fit very well as number two for, for Cyril. But for him to stand as a compromise for number one. Look, these two candidates in my mind seem not to be willing to entertain any compromise. Cyril Ramaphosa, I don't think he's willing to entertain any compromise because uh, it, it, it just doesn't, there's no return, there's never. no coming back yeah. for him. And Dlamini Zuma as well, age is not on her side as people are saying that uh, if she becomes a deputy, it's over. So we are going to see these two going all the way head on. Okay, we're going to take a break a little bit from uh, the succession debate and just talk about the presentation that we heard earlier in terms of the strategy and tactics uh, report that we got. Remember that this is where the ANC evaluates what they call the balance of forces. Where are the threats coming from in terms of them as a governing party? Is it uh, something from outside? Are the threats coming from outside or are they coming from within? And a little bit earlier, uh, Natim Tetwa, who's leading uh, that um, section or that discussion document talked to the media and this is what he had to say. And yes, we have not spoken about coalition. Not spoken about coalition. You see, the, the fact of the matter is that the African National Congress has to get its house in order for its own good and for the good of the people of South Africa. We don't believe that uh, we should uh, be preoccupying ourselves with coalitions. First, it's a very self-defeatist position or stance to take, you know. But second, we have conviction that we know what answers are, and those answers are in our hands, and we should actually do that which we say are our weaknesses, correct them, reclaim the lost ground, reconnect with, the, with our people, so that even those who have lost hope, because remember that part of the problem of uh, the ANC losing some of the major cities uh, in the country was precisely because of not being able to attend to some of the things which we know which have been raised or attending them not fully. And what we are saying is that it's in our hands if we want to be partial about it, the possibility is that we will partially lose lose support. If we want to uh, go all out and address that which we say ourselves, nobody's telling us, it's us who are saying it. 
and uh, we, we, we then will be able to turn the corner. So it's up to us. Teto, they speaking a little bit earlier to journalists, reporting back on the strategy and tactics uh, discussion document. And I found it quite conflicting in a way because the other discussion paper that talks to legislature and governance talks to how the ANC should start thinking about coalitions and start discussing, you know, under what conditions do they go into coalitions. But he's saying that would be a defeatist attitude. Yeah, actually, what is a self-defeatist attitude? is exactly the attitude that he has taken. <laughs> yeah. Because if you do not uh, in, uh, imagine uh, losing power, then you don't take steps to mitigate the possibilities or even to deal with that, that, pos that consequence of losing power. So we have seen in the metros, for example, that the ANC was not prepared mm. for a possibility that they may have to negotiate with the EFF, for example, yeah. negotiations which ultimately failed. Because they had, no, they had not thought about, about it. Yeah. And Secondly, we, we see where the ANC is in opposition now. Nelson Mandela Bay, Tuane, Johannesburg, and other places. You can see the ANC has no opposition strategy. In yes. the Western Cape, mm -hmm. in both the provincial legislature and in the city of Cape Town, the ANC is in disarray because it, it, it doesn't craft an opposition. It doesn't say, okay, should we be in opposition? This is how we're going to tackle issues for us to, to come back to power. Mm -hmm. So if, for as long as you don't think about that, for me, that's self defeatist And actually, I mean, going through the papers, if I, I actually did not see anywhere where the ANC talks about itself as an opposition party and what that needs to entail and what they need to do. Ralph, uh, I'm not sure if you've mm -hmm. seen anywhere where the ANC has any strategy on how to be an opposition party. No, actually, I have not. And uh, some senior members of ANC are reported to have actually raised the issue of coalitions far back within the party. And apparently, they were actually rebuked for uh, taking a position that says let us develop a criteria for deciding whether or not to go into coalition I mean the NC does not have to imagine what it means uh, actually to be in a position where you need to discuss this thing the, the facts on the ground are showing that the NC has lost metros maybe if the NC had a criteria on coalitions after the 2016 election, maybe they will still be in charge of some of, of one or two of those metros they lost remember you have the majority here as the ANC. They have the majority in some of the metros. Because of lack of a clearly articulated position when it comes to coalitions, they just give it away to other parties. And you look at many municipalities. Coalitions are there to stay within municipalities and also maybe coming in 2019. We don't know, but there is a high possibility. So the party that is in that position needs to think about a criteria as to how to actually confront and deal with that situation where you need another political party to actually form government. They haven't thought about it. It is the highest form of denial because the situation on the ground says that they need to have a clear position on this. And um, you, you, I mean, you look at Gauteng, they just managed 53%. Mm -hmm. There is a real danger that they could find themselves below the 50s. But that whole, why is it so difficult for them? So people have said this should be an adapt or die. And adapting yeah. means that you look at the reality that you're in and you try and say, how do we adapt? Should this actually happen? But how, why is it so difficult for them to cross and see the reality as it stands? It's denialism. They are just in pure denial of the reality on the ground. Not only uh, are they not facing the facts, as Ralph says, but they are also failing to even think about the worst that might happen to them. So not only, in fact, are they now at 53% as per the last national election. Mm. If you look at the last local government election, 2016, they, they actually went down. They are below 50% in Houting mm. as we speak. And that was before emails scandals started. Mm. Uh, th those elections last year were mainly driven by the Nkandla issue, the Togo Tiza matter, cabinet, reshuffle. cabinet reshuffles, mm. slow economic growth, unemployment, and general dissatisfaction about the ANC. It was not necessarily specifically about the performance of the metros, although that was a factor, but that was not the issue. The elections were driven mainly by national issues. Even the campaigning by all political parties, including the ANC, it was about national issues. It was almost as if it was not a municipal mm. electoral elections, contest. Yeah. Mm. So having gone through that and having seen the worst since then, of the ANC its performance in government. Uh, two, three downgrades down the line, technical recession down the line, um, Gupta emails down the line, uh, President Zuma in Gulf, in many other scandals mm. since the last local. You can imagine what will happen. What's the mm. average right now? Mm. If South Africans would vote to tomorrow or today? And they're still
still positioning themselves saying that you know the, the challenges we are facing are very similar to the attacks for example on Russia the mm. attacks on what is happening in Brazil and I found that there was quite of with that strategy and tactics which is a very crucial document for the mm. NC because that's where it defines who their enemies are what their threats are they're not talking to their own failures to implement some of their policies right? Matati, I think that uh, they're overreaching when they're saying the challenges they are having are similar to what Russia is having and what Vladimir Putin is having. I mean, look, there is state capacity in Russia. If you go to Russia, you know the guy who is in charge. Mm, you can mm. disagree with him, but you know where decision comes from. When you go, come to this country in South Africa, you don't know whether it's union building, is Saxon Weld or where. There is no longer the center in South Africa. The state capacity is at its worst. The government bureaucracy is not well aligned. There is no delivery. You can't compare yourself with China and Russia and to start to say the problems that you are having are the same. China and Russia, they are having much more complex ideological problems. You are having the basics of running water. It's not an ideological thing. Yeah. It's all about just taking care of those mm -hmm. basics. So they tend to want to, uh, to, to, to over, you know, uh, complicate the problems that they have. That is one of the reasons why I, I, I don't like the word, the balance of forces. I, I, it has become a swear word to me because every time you hear the NC doing strategies, tactics, balance of forces, the next is just to avoid the basic issues. The diagnosis is supposed to be simple. It's the basics. They are not having an ideological war. No one is challenging the NC's progressive policies of uh, lifting people through using social welfare. People generally are agreeing on those things. The problem, they can't get the basics of that done. I actually found it a bit refreshing listening from Zamani Sol saying, you know, their proposal is about the radical implementation of ANC policies. And I get a sense that it has been missing from a lot of the leaders. I found him to be more sensible and pragmatic, quite frankly, because... He admits that the problem is that even in previous resolutions taken in Mangao, mm. they were not able to implement because of lack of capacity. He just didn't go into detail about what causes the lack of capacity. Mm -hmm. But we can, we, can, we can determine sitting here that the ANC lacks capacity to conceptualize policies at the party level after a resolution is taken. Because it's one thing to resolve mm. that there must be a pharmaceutical company owned by the state. There must be a state bank. Someone in the ANC must sit and, and do research into globally and, and, and see how these things have been tackled by other countries and formulate ideas, be very innovative, formulate a research paper. The minister, an ANC minister who is a, 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 a leader, whether an ANC member or whatever, will then take a, a mandate from the ANC, armed with this concept from his party, and then he will develop into a government program, obviously following government regulations, could develop into a white paper, green paper, legislation, taken to cabinet, bureaucrats will put all of the other stuff that is required in terms of government policy, in terms of the constitution, and implement. So for as long as you can't, you don't have that leadership, that intellectual leadership from the party level, you can't expect the bureaucracy to start reading your policy conference resolutions and translate it to government policy. It's not going to happen. The minister must have the intellectual capacity to take the resolution, conceptualize the issues, brief whoever is uh, the researchers in, 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 the, in the government department, and take it to cabinet and then goes to parliament, goes to treasury, mm. appropriation, there's implementation. If that thing needs a, a bureaucratic uh, instrument, you set it up and you implement. But throughout the entire value chain that I've just described, there's lack of capacity throughout. Even worse, the tone of leadership that's set at the top is very weak because people, mm. the bureaucrats are looking at these ministers and thinking, mm. hey, this one uh, was at the Gupta uh, Oberoi Hotel the other day. This one has taken so much money. So the tone, mm. It's at the capacity of ethical level, at, at the capacity, at the level of uh, ethics, at the level of technical competency, at the level of intellectual competency. Mm -hmm. And other people have even argued that every time there's a cabinet reshuffle, mm. those that work in those departments literally feel that there has been regime change because the one minister would have been going in a certain direction. And even though it's an ANC minister that is coming in, mm. they want to overhaul everything that has been done and put in their own thing. And by that time, five years is over. Exactly. I mean, uh, that is what creates lack of coherence. That is what creates uh, uh, lack of consistency within the bureaucracy. And, and I have to say, South Africa's bureaucrats, and I'm speaking as someone who used to, to be, be a, a bureaucrat, bureaucrat in yeah. government, yeah. South Africa's bureaucrats have also noticed the absence of political leadership by ANC ministers. I mean, when a minister's concern is to make sure that uh, private interests that are associated with him or her get a particular mind, 
that means that they will not attend to issues actually relating to the core of their department. If you look at this Gupta email, there is an indication that actually you are seeing much more buoyant bureaucrats becoming actually more and more corrupt. Treasury has had this uh, 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 indication where they are looking at the number of senior managers just doing business with government. It's because they see opportunities. The landlord is not there. The minister who is supposed to politically oversee the department and provide core leadership, get researchers as well. They are not there. But even worse, Matlatsi, is the position of parliamentarians. Mm. I have observed parliament across the world. Most of our members of parliament don't even have research staff. The research is usually a, 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 a conglomeration for a particular mm. caucus. But as a, as a minister, let's say you're running the minerals and resources department, you need a good contingency. The advisors and they're exactly. there to be helping out. I mean, we as are an, paying as an, for advisors exactly. in this country. As an MP, you should have that capacity mm. so that you can fully interrogate mm. the ministers. But you don't find that MPs go there, ask sweetheart questions. Once in a while, when the MPs are angry with the political leadership of the ANC, they then ask the right question. That's not how you function. Bumi, you want to add to that? Yeah, well, that's why I think one of the things that are, um, is lacking in this country is the qualification framework for someone to be a public representative. So what, what kind of qualifications do you need to be an MP mm. or a cabinet minister or a president or deputy president? That conversation, so we've, we've never had that conversation in this country. It's always like, okay, well, this comrade, you know, is stranded. Let's put him on the list and you become an MP. That's why we're having these capacity problems. Good policies don't get implemented. The right tone is not set at the ministerial level. The bureaucracy has got no leadership. And people keep on making noises. And the people that are qualified mm. and are in those departments get frustrated and they leave for the private sector. Exactly. exactly. I mean, you want to save your career and reputation. It appears that uh, you need to move away from the public service. Quite the contrary with what people are having in France. I've, mm. I've had reports and writing that actually to be a public servant in France is very, very high. There is so much respect for that. Actually, it might even be easier going and being a banker than being a public servant. They've got a rigorous mechanism through which they are putting those people through. Hence, people yeah. know what they're doing. Even in China, by the way, China not with it's problems of not being a democracy and that's a really big problem but one thing they've done is that in terms of the mandarins the bureaucrats in government they choose from the best and even in, in politics by the way the political leadership you have to go through the ranks not just by the number of years we have spent or the number of different positions we have occupied for you to be the, the premier uh, of China you actually they take you through all kinds of technical training intellectual training you are by the time you become uh, the, the premier of, of, of China. You are actually the most astute person, both in terms of the Communist Party of uh, the, the Communist Party policies, as well as managing issues as far as globalization issues. You are the most well versed with all of those issues. In South Africa, we don't have that. The ANC used to have uh, this scalar development program, political education thing. We know it has collapsed. Yeah. One mm. of the resolutions they took many years ago was that there must be a political school. Yeah, which uh, the former president, Khalima Mutlanti, was supposed to have. They even got money to, to build some infrastructure where people could go. But I don't know what happened to that man. Yeah, uh, I think the last time I remember the Secretary General Gwede Mantache saying he was in China for about a week or two to basically come back and actually start implementing uh, that political school. But we haven't heard, mm. you know, what form it's supposed to take. And as far as I remember, the Deputy President Khalima Mutlante, it just never happened. Mm. That's 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 his version from him. But I wanted to also talk about something else that Natim Teta talked about. He touched on. BRICS and the BRICS Bank uh, and, and, and basically saying that, you know, they, they, they want to continue to push mm -hmm. for that BRICS Bank to be coming to South Africa. How is it going to help us as a country? Well, I, I don't see how this... South Africa is a very sophisticated uh, market economy with strong banks, very complex, uh, complex financial uh, system that includes, by the way, state banks, private banks, and so forth. We've got a post... Post Bank, we've got the Development Bank of Southern Africa, we've got other financial institutions like the IDC, we've got, uh, well, the NEF is now being absorbed yeah, under the IDC, IDC. Mm -hmm. you got, uh, someone spoke about the regional banks like your Itala Bank mm -hmm. and all of that. And our, our financial system is ranked in the uh, World Economic Forum Index as among the top. Mm -hmm. uh, so South Africa could, if it runs its economy properly, it can access credit anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it can 
it can, can go global and, 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 and actually, we, South Africa doesn't really need this uh, 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 BRICS uh, bank. Um, uh, but I think part of the global alliances that it is trying to, to form, you know, it's like, okay, guys, to prevent us going to the IMF in future, to prevent us going to the World Bank in future, these global banks are run from Washington and America and its allies have got a bigger voting share mm. there. Um, so let's set up our own institution as part of the reforming of multilateral institutions. I think mm. Nati didn't articulate it uh, properly, but mm. I think it's about that. Mm. Uh, he could have actually explained why the ANC is actually agreeing to this uh, BRICS bank thing. But we should also be careful because China, uh, joined by members of the European Union like, like Russia, China has formed its own infrastructure bank. Mm. And it doesn't include the BRICS uh, countries. And they are so, going mm -hmm. ahead and uh, investing massively on the continent already. Yes, and Germany said, oh no, China is uh, infrastructure, we, we want to be part of it. So Germany is part of it. Because China doesn't think in, in, it doesn't think in small blocks mm. like BRICS. China sees itself as a global player. So it's not part, it can't be part of this factional you know, mm. thing there and there. So it, it plays big. So we have to be careful not to play small while the partners of BRICS are actually playing big. Mm. I think there is also an overstatement as to what South Africa think they can achieve from, from, from BRICS. Uh, you travel across the continent, China is becoming the biggest lender actually on the continent. And the problem with, 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 with African countries, including also South Africa, is that they tend to be not willingness to actually engage with China on the terms of, of this lending, on the terms of this infrastructure uh, uh, expenditure and investment that we have seen China have. Actually, there is a, always a great deal of secrecy around this because when African leaders are dealing with China and all, they don't take China through the bureaucracy of our own. It's more like China goes to see the president and, and, and the one person contacts and that's the signature it. Comes, yeah. But what, what worries me more about the whole thing of the BRICS Bank is that it's not meant to be practical. When it comes to practical approach, South Africa does not necessarily have a problem in accessing funds. Actually, even a lot of debt that is being held by your ESCOM and so forth, you ask economists, they will tell you that it is actually locally based debt. Mm. You can still get mm. money from within. Mm. We are very solid when it comes to our ability to generate capital. And if you maintain a stable economic infrastructure, avoid things such as downgrading, you get even better and better. So the whole thing of BRICS, it's meant for ideological purposes. It is actually meant to say that there is a shift when it comes to uh, this global relation, uh, the influence of uh, uh, lending institutions on local economies. It, it, it is, you can have that BRICS bank as long as African leaders are not willing to negotiate in the interest of their people. Because remember, they, they negotiate, but it's not in the interest of their people. Perhaps it's in the interest of uh, you know, getting returns for themselves personally. You don't see that patriotism they talk about when they're accessing this uh, investment from China. That, for me, is a concern. And of course, I want us to throw ahead, because tomorrow we're going to be talking about mm. other policy issues mm. that we can expect from um, this conference. And one that I'm seeing that's going to also be contested is this issue of um, free education at a tertiary level. Mm. We've already heard from the ANC Youth League, especially in KwaZulu-Natal again, saying that, you know, whatever uh, the commission that was investigating, whether it's feasible for government to pay for it, they won't accept anything less than uh, free education at a tertiary level. But that debate also itself within the ANC has been very factional in terms of how strong do they push the current Minister of Higher Education to actually implement it. Can we expect that to be a big issue in this uh, conference? I think it will be a big issue because uh, remember that um, the fallist movement in South Africa is growing, never mm. mind the conspiracy mm. behind it that uh, Mantashe said the other yep, day. It's part of the colored revolution. But the reality yeah. is that they do think about mm. what the students are demanding. And uh, I think that the fact that the president appointed this commission to look at the uh, feasibility of implementing um, a, a viable funding system in the higher education sector speaks to the fact that they take it very seriously. But Unfortunately for the students and for the four list and all the people that are fighting for, for free higher education, it would actually be very difficult for the government to implement it. They can take a position as a principal position. They can take a position that says, let's progressively implement it. And by the way, it won't be a new position because mm, in 1992, in this place, the ANC took a position before it came to government that there must be free higher education 
uh, at uh, uh, primary and secondary school. And then it says, as far as higher education, uh, it must be progressively implemented depending on availability of resources. Mm. But it's also the economy is in technical so, recession yeah, now, so yeah. which means the resources are not available. Mm. Because I mean, how do you actually go ahead and implement it? I mean, there's a lot of money that would be involved, especially to ensure that you keep the standards that we currently have at many of our tertiary institutions. You know, when it comes to education, they have no choice because this one has potential direct consequences. I mean, the growth of the Follis movement has become a political project. You do have other parties. You have the EFF working very hard on building a relationship with the Follies movement, making that a political project. And if the ANC doesn't block that gap, unfortunately, it will not be able to come up with an acceptable response to the student. And I think that uh, the problem is the extremes that you see in discussing this thing. You can come up with a model to try to progressively do it, maybe come up with rapid uh, intervention and try to scale it as you go about it. I think that what we have though, it's still at sloganeering uh, uh, level. I mean, researchers have already made some modeling document as to mm. how you can actually fund this. There is a litany of work out there where people are trying to assist. What the ANC has to do is to take some of those research work and become practical. Instead of approaching this thing through an ultimatum approach, we are either having this or not, mm -hmm. that is not going to work. Mm. Well, gentlemen, I think uh, that is going to be where we leave it for Politiki. Uh, it's been day four of uh, the ANC's uh, National Policy Conference. And thank you very much to our resident analyst, Ralph Matecha, and also Mpumele Lomkabela. Remember, you can join us again tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock right here on News 24 as we look ahead at the other commissions. What are the issues that are coming out in terms of policy proposals? We know that, for example, the health minister, Aaron is very passionate about implementation of NHI, but he's, um, he's been criticized by the tripartite alliance uh, members like Kosati who are saying he's been stalling, but he says he's got a plan in place. And those are some of the things that we'll be talking about. Obviously, another issue is around the state-owned entities and the crisis that they are also facing. We'll be trying to get deeper into what are the delegates saying about some of these very key institutions in our country that are supposed to be the driving force for that radical uh, uh, economic transformation that the ANC does talk about. And perhaps we'll have more leaders talking about radical implementation of policies as the ANC's uh, provincial chain, the Northern Cape, Zamani Sol has said. So from us here and uh, from Politiki, that's it from now. <laughs>